Thank you. I'm not going to start yet. We're just trying to get the volume right here. So. Is, that, is that okay? Is that loud enough? Should I get it closer? Can you all hear me? You good? Okay. Thanks, Landon. You can be pressing space or arrows. To, yeah. Yeah, space bars. I'll turn it off. And it will hand over to me at the same time, right? In the yeah. Right I'll, stop, I'll stop there. Huh? Yeah, for sure. Cool. We have seven people. <laughs> Right, yeah, good question. I can, I can be here when introducing you. Right, I'm stand over here. I'll say, I'm like, I'm going to join the Clerical Crimson. I'll say, if you want to sit down. You need some pre- uh, presenter because if you want to walk and switching the slides, it's. Oh, there's no big deal. There might be someone. Different parts of the cities they use. Oh, really? Different words. Okay, okay. 
it's strange that in, in Poland they use urwa, which is like pretty pretty uh, nasty in our country, but in their country it's like they use it all the time. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so it loses the weight. <laughs> Inflation. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. Yeah. That's funny. Well, I, I can imagine too, like, from what I understand of, of like, Czech and kind of Slavic languages, is there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of diminutives, right? Mm -hmm. So that those, I can imagine there's probably tons of swear words that all that kind of sound similar, but they have different endings. Is that the case? Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Like, you can just kind of change it a little bit depending on how you feel. Or <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. The, the derived, yeah. What's, what's interesting that a lot of those swear words has her in it, like because it's because the stress, like. <laughs> you really get yeah. mad. <laughs> is, <laughs> is that the R with the hook over it? No, no, it's a, it's even worse. Oh wow. Yeah, we have Rzic, like something like S, but it's not as common. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, perdel, perdel is us. This is this nice word. I like perdel. <laughs> It does sound nice. <laughs> so what is what's the what's the R noise and what what does a character look like for that? Pardel? Yeah. B R D E L. B R D E L. Okay. Pardel. And uh, the R and the D, do they have anything? No no no. no. Okay. Just without any. Yeah. But see that's what that's what throws me off. When I see like B R D it's like uh, that word like T R A no tutter. I'm like, am I supposed to say the age or what? Like, how do I say? You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I've added one slide today. It was this one here, yeah. just to sum up the demo because. Oh, nice! And you put the brain fog in there. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for the the logo of the language, but it, apparently there is none. So. Okay. I think it's like it simulates the language. If anybody, if anybody knows it, like yeah, you know immediately what it is. You know what it is? It's hello world in brain fog. Hello world. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I cannot read brain fog. I understand yeah, yeah. it, what it means, but yeah, I can't. I can't mentally you know, figure <laughs> it out. This time. Nine no, we start in fifty or forty. Uh, Eleven or forty? Yeah, forty. Nine more minutes. I think it's 50. Oh, 40, you're right. Eight more minutes. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're on eight. Yeah. <laughs> so are you are you prepared for like how hot it's going to be in Washington, D.C.? Yeah, I saw that. Like, for, yeah, it's pretty hot there. Wa I don't know if you know it or not, but Washington, D.C. is basically built on top of a swamp. Uh -huh. So it's it's really humid it's all the time. Uh, not all the time. Like in the winter time, it snows and stuff. Uh -huh. But in the summertime, it gets hot and it gets really humid there too. Because of the swamp, right? Because of the swamp, exactly. Is it smelly there? Uh, no, no, no. I mean, no more than you ever see. <laughs> Just cars and stuff like that. But it's but you won't. You don't know that you're on a swamp. Right? Mm -hmm. you, you can't tell. But that it'll just be really muggy, be really humid. Mm -hmm. Oh, and stuff like that, so. Yeah, the temperature is pretty high, and if it's also humid, yeah, yeah we'll die. Yeah, so just like spend a lot of time in the museum. Too. They're nice <laughs> and air conditioned. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know, you, if you want to go see the Washington Monument and stuff, like it's that, close actually. Yeah. Oh, it's I, close? I saw it in the news in, in the morning. I turned on my TV, and they said like it's repairing. It'll be open in a month. So. What about the Lincoln Memorial? Can you go see that? You know, the big statue of Abraham Lincoln? Uh, I think so, yeah. That's like sitting cool. Lincoln, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will check the Capitol. That's a classic one, yeah. isn't it, too? But you should be able to you should be able to see the Washington Monument from there, but yeah. if you can't yeah. go yeah. up, you can still see it. The park is pretty huge. Yeah. I don't know if it's if people are allowed to go there, because it's pretty, pretty big. Oops. These are the points I, I would like to visit. Yeah, and there's a, a grave of Kurgel in Princeton, so I want to <laughs> take a photo from him. Oh, it's fly off, yeah. Yeah, this is pretty huge, actually. I don't know if people are allowed to go there or walk in yes, the park. Yes, you can. Yeah, you okay. can. Yeah. The reflecting pool. You can definitely. I don't, you may not be able to get all the. Well, yeah, you go from the Lincoln Memorial, you can walk along mm -hmm. here, and you'll be able to see. The, you know, the memorial there. And 
there was the scene for Forrest Gump, right? In the yes, yeah. yes, yeah, exactly. They, that's where they had the uh, the big rally, yeah. and yeah, he comes running across right the, the water. <laughs> yeah, Jamie. <laughs> now, did you have you read anything about how the streets are laid out? No. Did you look at this? So, like, uh, go to where the wine. If you go to where. The, Hey guys, how hey, are you? Not bad. How are you so? Down here? Uh, yeah. yeah, pretty much. Okay, cool. We're just goofing around at this point. Sorry. Right. <laughs> uh, do you want the light left on for now, or uh, you can turn it off? That's fine. Okay. okay. Um, if you see like, if you see how the how there's like a circle over here and these lines go out and everything. Uh -huh. Look, look online about conspiracy theories about that because uh, uh, there's people say the Masons, uh, they all the guys who founded the city were Freemasons, right? And so they drew out the lines of the city and, and people draw like an owl and stuff. But like, they say the lines make an owl, oh like, my god, or like a star shape and stuff like that. So read about it. It's really, it's really. <laughs> if you count all the streets, you will get like six, six, six. Right, right, exactly, exactly, it's exactly. Strange. Yeah. But if you yeah, if you yeah, see like it's strange, yeah. it's like Broadway. Yeah. Right, right. And if you look at where the White House is, it's all kind of centered around there. Yeah, so there's there's the White House, and then you see like there's this circle here, and you see how like, and then these things go out, and, and so people have like taken the streets and they they, they draw lines over it to show like here's the owl. And, you know, it's like crazy. It's fun. It's fun. Turn off. Oh, so we can have like one. One browser with the presentation, and the other one for because I will need the browser as well. Okay, that will be easier to like switch between. Yeah, I won't need the switch at all. So do whatever's convenient for you. Put it in the beginning. Oh, and Control Five makes it full screen. If you if you lost the full screen, Control Five and Control is FM. I will like, switch it. Okay. Okay. So Control F Five makes it full screen. Okay. Cool. But if you want to leave the, the full screen mode, you don't have to put, like, turn it on again. So. Yeah, I won't, I won't mess with it. I think escape with it there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> <laughs> slowly. <laughs> slowly, but surely. We'll get everyone to show up right at the last minute. Stuff you will have to people. <laughs> All right. I think there are like 17 attendees to confirm that they will hear that. Well, 10 so percent. Yeah. yeah, I put that too. So. <laughs> What's the. Oh, is, it, is this the one to hmm? turn on the. The, to turn on the mirroring or whatever? Yes, it's uh, Control F7. Okay. And. Oh, it doesn't work because it's probably behind the. Alright, oh. oh, it's not Control, it's FM, sorry. Okay. So, so Control is actually FM. Oh, so. you switched to both. Yeah, okay, yeah. Gotcha. We can turn it on like this. Okay, so it should be a mirror. Oh,
to get started. Yep, we all set? Get going? All right, cool. All right, great. Um, so my name is Michael McEwen, and I'm joining Yurka Kremser today uh, to talk about polyglot operators and, in specific, the Spark operator. Uh, we're both engineers at Red Hat, uh, and this is based on a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last few years. All right, so just a little outline. Uh, I'm going to start with kind of a history lesson of, of how we got here, how we arrived at the operator pattern. Um, then we'll go into how the operator pattern works and kind of what are the pieces of it. At that point, I'm going to hand it over to Yurka, and he's going to talk about the Spark operator and how we built it. He'll talk a little bit about um, an abstract oper operator library that we've been working on to make these things easier. We'll talk a little bit about different languages that you can write operators in. And then lastly, we'll talk about the OLM, which is the Operator Lifecycle Manager. So to start with, let's just get a quick show of hands. How many people here are familiar with Kubernetes? Okay, so a pretty good chunk of the audience. So I'm not going to go into too deep about Kubernetes, but as most of us know, Kubernetes has all different types of objects in it. You know, like these objects represent the resources that exist within a cluster. You know, you have deployments, services, pods. This is just a handful of what's there. And as users, the first patterns that we came across for how you instantiate these objects is making miles of YAML code that you can then inject into your Kubernetes cluster. And this is a portion of a manifest that our team has been working on. And you know, I couldn't even at six point font, I can't fit the whole thing on one slide. So you can this is just obscene, right? Like having to manage something like this. And as a user, the pattern I want to do is I want to take this manifest, I want to tell Kubernetes about it, and then Kubernetes will deploy something for me. Whatever it is I'm trying to do, it will do that. And if I always have to be the one controlling this, it just it can get very onerous on me to have to continually do this and maintain these manifests, especially when the patterns we use inside the manifest are repeated many times. So early on in the Kubernetes days, there was this idea of what we wanted was a control application that could sit inside of Kubernetes and could do the work of controlling these manifests and creating objects for us. But there's a problem that exists with this. Who's, who's the user who's doing that action? If I run the commands from the command line, I've logged into a cluster that has you know, some sort of authentication on it, and it knows who I am, and it allows me to do work. But if I put an application into the cluster, and that application wants to create objects, who is the user who's doing that? Because I'm not logged in at that point. Just the application is running. And there's a notion of something called a service account. And this is something that can do work for you inside the cluster. And this is what we used early on to build applications that could do this type of operation. Now, to take things a little further, once we built these control applications, what we wanted was to have other applications that could speak to them and say, I would like some resource to be deployed for me, and I don't want to have to manage the manifests or the objects that are associated with that. I'd like the control application to do it. So now you can imagine we're even one step further removed from what user is running all this. And the answer to this came in the form of what were known as controllers or more recently operators. So these are kind of the basics of the operator pattern. It gave us a way to extend Kubernetes so we could start to build custom applications that could control uh, various object life cycles inside Kubernetes. 
It, it's also kind of fundamentally tied to the idea of resources and controllers. So in general, a controller is a type of pattern, a loop that can watch objects and do things for you. And controller is really the language that is at the heart of this. But where controllers differentiate themselves from operators, and, and, a, con and a controller is, or an operator is a type of controller, but an operator has the notion of being tied to custom resources. And those custom resources are what allow you to describe complex uh, topologies or architectures using something that you can control. Now, controllers are able to react on events that occur inside of Kubernetes. And you know, we, we put CRUD here, but we kind of crossed out the R because really a controller is watching creation events, it's watching update events, and it's watching deletion events. It, it's not watching read events because you know, you're not going to watch when everyone's reading an object. It's just out of the scope for what they're doing. And you might see in the Kubernetes documentation, the, these terms get kind of confused sometimes. So if you search for operator, you can find that in the Kubernetes documentation. But you'll also find this term custom controllers. That's another you know, piece of language they use. And a lot of this goes into how these patterns evolved and how they were brought into the Kubernetes community. And this is kind of a historical thing that just has to do with who developed the technology and how these words were differentiated from each other. So in general, and I'm just going to do this from a very high level. I'm not going to get into the internal control loops and whatnot. But this is our pattern. We have an operator that's running that before I might have called the control application. And it wants to tell the Kubernetes API, I want to listen for some sort of resource. And this CRX is, you know, this is our custom resource. This is whatever we've created that we want to monitor. So we tell Kubernetes, all right, I'd like to listen to this object. And initially, Kubernetes is just like, oh, yeah, OK, whatever. Like, you know, you do you, I'll do me. But what's happening internally in Kubernetes is you've set up a watcher so that when Kubernetes gets a new event on the custom resource you're looking for, your operator will get notified about that. And now you can do some sort of action depending on what it is you need to do. So at that point, the operator kind of says, all right, um, you've asked for some new resource, or maybe you've deleted a resource. What do I need to do to clean up for this complex you know, arch architecture that you've deployed into Kubernetes? And so then the operator can say, all right, well, you know, maybe deploy this many replicas or change the state of something, depending on, you know, this would all get into the specifics of what your custom resource was trying to do. And then Kubernetes will say, all right, yeah, you wanted to delete this. Or maybe a deletion event comes in, and Kubernetes is able to inform your operator that, hey, someone just deleted this, this uh, custom resource that you made. And maybe your custom resource represents several pods and services. And your operator can now go through and clean all that stuff up. Like we see, your operator can now send that back. And this is all taking the place of what we used to see in these manifests and running command line operations. This is all happening in the cloud now. So I don't need to be running this from my command line. Now, I, you know, we, I mentioned custom resources, and this is kind of the representation. This is talking about how we represent these resources. So we create something called a custom resource definition. And this is how we inject new object types into Kubernetes. So you saw in the beginning, I had some, some of the different objects up there, like pod, service, et cetera. In the case of what we're going to talk about specifically, we wanted to make a Spark resource, because uh, Spark is a distributed computing platform. It can have many different nodes that get to Deployed, and we wanted one resource to manage that instead of looking at all the different pods that make that up. And so custom resources are what come out of the definition. So once I've defined something, I say I've defined a Spark cluster. Now the custom resource itself is an actual instantiation of that. You know, they, they bundle in a lot of the same things that you see in the other objects. You can represent the state or the life cycle of what's going on. There's all sorts of information um, that you can encode in there. Now, the last line here about config maps, you don't have to use custom resource definitions. Those are the most commonly accepted, and I think the that's the way you want to extend Kubernetes. But it is possible to create watchers that watch other things. And so uh, config maps are a way to put data into the Kubernetes uh, you know, store, into etcd, so, that it, so Kubernetes can know about it. And you could actually set up a watcher on config maps and have some sort of you know, complex structure 
inside there that you could do action on. We have some of that in the abstract operator, and we mainly did it because um, in platforms like OpenShift, where you have a strong role-based authentication setup, creating a custom resource definition is something that only a cluster administrator can do. Whereas a config map, anyone can create one of those. So it makes it much easier for a standard user to come and start you know, doing whatever activity you'd like them to do. This is a quick example of what a custom resource looks like. This is not the definition. This is actually what the resource would look like. So, you know, you can see we've made a kind here called a Spark cluster. Um, in this case, we're giving it a name. This is for an actual specific deployment. You know, we can tell it how many workers and masters. And this is all specific information to the actual application that we're writing. So, you know, in the case of a Spark cluster, this is information we want to know about. If you were deploying something else, maybe a, a database of some type or a website or you know something along those lines, this information would be specific to whatever it is you're doing, basically. So a couple quick notes here. Um, as I said, custom resource definitions are the main way to extend Kubernetes. This is the community is kind of rallying behind this as the main way to add your own custom extensions into Kubernetes and then building operators around those. Uh, one of the kind of nice things about this is you can imagine the kube, uh, kubectl command, normally when I, when I want to look at an object, I say, you know, kubectl git pods or kubectl git services. It's, it's much nicer if I could say kubectl git spark cluster and see my spark cluster as one object as opposed to saying kubectl, give me back everything in this project which has all the pods that go with my masters and workers, all the services that are related with them, all the deployments that are associated with that. So you can imagine that for, for managing these things, it's much easier just to be able to look at one entry than to look at like kind of an exploding list of things that make up all the resources. And also, on systems like you know, OpenShift and other distros that, and, and you know, vanilla Kubernetes that has RBAC enabled, the role-based authentication, you can now start to put access controls on who can create custom resources. So you can start to get really fine-grained control of how those things can be made. And like I said, in OpenShift, you know, and other in other Kubernetes distros where there is a strong role-based authentication, you might be restricted in, in how many custom resources you can make or, or how many definitions you can put into the system, or, or even if you can. Um, so it's something to kind of keep in mind as you do this. Now, it, you know, it, we might just think, well, all the operator is doing is just deploying manifest for me, right? But it, it can actually do a lot more than that. And there's a lot of tooling around this, and, and Yurka's going to talk about some of that tooling. But, you know, manifests are just the beginning. Um, you can use Ansible. There's an Ansible operator where you can just take Ansible playbooks and put all the logic, the conditional and looping logic that goes into those. Those can be encoded inside an operator. Um, if you're familiar with Helm charts, which is a, a very specific way to deploy things that the Kubernetes community likes. You can also encode those inside of operators, uh, case on it, and customize our other methodologies. You can go even further than that and write, um, write operators in specific languages. And, and Yurka's going to show you how we did that with Java. So now we can use Java code to do all sorts of complex tasks that maybe a manifest or an Ansible playbook would not be able to do. Now, this is an example uh, that we pulled out of the O'Reilly Kubernetes Patterns book. This is actually Bash. So just to show you how flexible these operators are, this is really all that's happening at the, at the base of an operator. You know, we've got a few pieces up here that set up um, kind of how you connect to the Kubernetes cluster. But then all we're doing is setting up a watch and then we just kind of loop continually. And this is our, what's sometimes referred to as the reconciliation loop. So this loop continually runs, and when new events come in, your application will get notified. Or if not, that loop will run once every, you know, however, whatever the cycle you have set up to run on, it will run and see, okay, have new objects been created? Is there some work I need to do? So this was just an example to show you really how simply these things can be written. I, I wouldn't recommend writing them in Bash, but if, if you feel that way, you could do it this way. So I'm going to hand it over to Yurka now, and he's going to talk a little bit more about the actual implementation details. Thank you, Mike. First, I'll start the cluster. Uh, 
so so thanks for for in introducing the general information about operators i will focus more on like one particular instance, uh, which is Spark Operator. It's written in Java. For those who don't know Spark, it's a unified analytics engine for distributed data processing. And this operator uh, supports free uh, custom resources, Spark cluster application, and uh, history server. Uh, the Spark cluster obviously deploys Spark cluster application. It represents an application that can itself deploy a Spark cluster that's de desired or dedicated for this application. And history server is something that can keep track of your running jobs. So it started as a toy project, and now it's adopted by AI COE project called the Open Data Hub. And it's compatible with uh, Google's operator on the CRD level. So uh, it's written in different language. It's written in Java. The Google's operator is written in Go. But the CRDs or custom resources look the same way, so people can migrate smoothly between those two. Right, so let's, let's look how it looks like. Uh, I have the cluster deployed, so first I need to deploy the operator. Is, is the font visible? Cool. So I will show you the manifest of the operator first. Uh, it's always Vim actually. It contains, it's a list of YAMLs that does the deployment of the operator. It contains service account, uh, the role that's assigned for the service account, and the most important part is the deployment, where we specify uh, the Docker image or the container image that's going to represent the operator, and with this environment variable, we are saying like watch in this namespace, watch for events in this namespace. This convention bring, bring brought by OLM and also specifying the, the limits. So let's apply it. Oh, um, uh, I have to look as an uh, admin, sorry. So this is exactly what we were talking about before. We long believe that OpenShift is going. OpenShift has a strong role-based authentication, so it needs to elevate its privileges in order to make the actual resources that the operator will be yeah, because I was required for cluster admin rights because I was also creating CRDs. So now everything passed and I'm watching the, the pods. So there is a new pod uh, called Spark Operator and it's running and listening for events. I can split the screen and show you the logs of the operator. It's an, an alias for, for showing the logs of the operator. And I'll make it bigger again. Uh, it started and it's also it already exposed an endpoint. If I open it in a browser, this is endpoint with metrics. So the part of the framework is also exposing a couple of simple metrics that can be scraped by Prometheus. Oops. And I can now deploy or create the custom resource for the Spark cluster and hopefully it will be caused by the operator that will create the actual Spark cluster for us. Again, split the screen. So this is the example of the custom resource for the Spark cluster, and when I apply it, yeah, here, here we can see the in the logs that operator called this event and is creating Spark cluster for us. And we can see a new three new pods because because we asked for one instance of master and two instances for workers. So they are being deployed and now they are ready. We can verify that it's already Spark cluster by by exposing the um, Spark UI. So let's do that. A lot of resources were actually created. There was replication controllers involved, pods, and services. And if I expose the service for Spark UI, it should be responding. So we just created a route for the web UI. Here it is, the web UI for the Spark. And I can also create a new notebook for that can attach to the Spark cluster and simulate the client application, the driver. For that, I will create simple, I will OC new app. And I will also expose the service for 
a newly created notebook. So this is the new workshop notebook that we'll try to attach to the cluster. But it needs a token, so first I need to grab it from the logs. This is like a security mechanism for Jupyter. It can be turned off. I have the default settings. Here is the token. So it contains a couple of notebooks, and one of them is a notebook for connecting to Spark application. By default, it tries to spin up its own local cluster on, on localhost, but we can provide an external uh, host name. And this should correspond to a service uh, represented by the Spark cluster. So the Spark is listening on port 7077. So let me put it here. And if I evaluate the cell by pressing Ctrl Enter, uh, we should be able to see in the Spark web UI, before it was no connected application, but if I refresh the page, there is now one Spark shell application connected to it, so it, it works. Yeah, so it was the Spark operator in a nutshell. It has a lot of more features, but it was the basics. So how it was done? Like this was the basically this is basically the implementation that can fit into one slide, because of course I'm hiding the complexity by the method calls. But in a nutshell, it's a one class. This is for one watcher. This is for the cluster operator. We extend abstract operator, which is which comes from the library, and we have to override methods on add, on delete, and on modify, which basically handles the events about the custom resource of the Spark cluster. So and we are using Kubernetes client for for this. So this is like the, what's happening. I'm showing you the shiny thing, but a lot of stuff is happening under the cover. And one of those libraries, one of the dependencies is Kubernetes Fabricate Client. It has Fluent API. Uh, it's it's a type safe client, so it works with method calls. I don't have to like compose strings and call those strings. And what's really convenient about the client is that it just works out of the box. It tries to figure out from which environment it was invoked, and it grabs the security from either config file, kube config file, or as a mounted secrets from the container. And the other library was the abstract operator, and that's something that I've created for other Java people that would like to write operators in Java or JVM languages. And it automates the bootstrapping of the application, but also uh, creating of those watchers for those event loops. And also it supports a JSON schema as a single source of truth, so you can describe your entity, uh, entity objects as a JSON schema, and that will create classes for your, it will bootstrap your application with entity classes. And it, both approaches are supported, custom resource and config maps. As Mike has mentioned, config maps may be useful for testing or when you don't have the cluster admin rights in Kubernetes. Recently, uh, Quarkus.io support was added, so now it can uh, use the GraalVM compiler for ahead of time compilation and it can create a similar binary as Golang does. So it's just one binary when everything is statically linked together and it can be added to a container and you can basically use like from scratch. I wouldn't recommend it, but you can do that in, in your Docker files. Add just this one library and, and this, just one binary and run it. It supports also CDI and uh, it's just context and dependency injection. But it has to it had to sacrifice like peak performance for the boot speed because that's what the Graal compiler does. I have examples for other languages which are only the, the JVM languages currently, but GraalVM also supports like really polyglot interoperation, but this is not done yet. So I have examples for Java, Scala, Kotlin, Groovy, Haskell, JavaScript. And the talk promised that it will be polyglot operators, so now I'll show another demo, which is crazy. <laughs> uh, First, I need to I will I run, run the, the VS code and in the behind the uh, make file. This is build, building the project and deploying the operator. So I will be I first go through the code. So it's an application written in Groovy. 
And as you can see, we are also again extending the abstract operator class. This is like generic class, and where the bar type parameter is the uh, entity we are watching. And in this Groovy class, we are import statically importing uh, a function from a language called Frege, which is an implementation of Haskell on top of JVM. So this is three languages, Groovy, Java, and Haskell. And also, uh, later on, we will also import a, a feature or fun function from a language called BrainFuck. And so what, it operate, what this operator does, it watches for cast config maps, and it will basically create another config map with the result. So uh, in the config map, it expects an input, which is a number, and it creates a new config map, uh, which is a calculated like n Fibonacci member of, those, of the sequence. So it should be running by now, and it's a config map watcher. So, watcher. so now if I create a new config map, started doing something, and if I ask for all the config maps in the cluster, ah, cut look. There's the first one. I have created this one by this OC apply. I can show that I'm not lying. So this is the first. This is the input, basically, for the algorithm, and this one was created by the operator. So if I show the result, missing CM. So this is, uh, so it says result is this huge number, which it happens to be 42nd uh, member of the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, but what it also did was calculating a pi. It's like really uh, artificial example, but it can say the interoperability between multiple more or less esoteric languages. And the pi function, pi approximation was done in this main, main method. So here we have like on add handler, which calculates the Fibonacci uh, number, but also calls the main method, which comes from this statically imported function. So if you look into it, it's a, a BF interpreter written in uh, Frege, and all it does. It has three methods, uh, pi approximation, hello world, and nine to zero. And this main method calls the pi approximation. So this is this is the program for approximating pi in BrainFuck. It's readable, right? And as we can see, it, it was written in the log. So this is the uh, pi approximation. And here it has a very simple uh, UI or interface that if I put more pluses here, it will calculate like the more, uh, the, uh, this is the number of, of uh, digits we want to approximate. So it's like unary uh, coding. And this is the content of the tape of the simulating machine. So just to sum up, we had a plan being written in Groovy that was extending class from, from Java. Uh, the, the library was added as a normal JAR library through Gradle, and this is logo for, for Frege, which is basically Haskell on the JVM. And from Frege, we firstly called the N Fibonacci number, and then we were able to simulate the BrainFuck language using the interpreter, and which itself approximated the pi. It's a really artificial demo, but it can show you like that operators are not only go, go action. So, People today write operate operators a lot in Go, which makes sense because all the ecosystem is written in Golang, Docker is written in Golang, Kubernetes is written in Golang, but Go is not as important or is not as popular as, as Java in those indices. And I would argue that uh, a lot of existing infrastructure is still written in Java, and it may make sense to use the same language for the operand and the operator itself. People complain a lot about startup startup time when it comes to Java and memory fruit footprint, but it gets much better with the Porkers and GraalVM recently. And as for the Spark operator, the foot memory footprint is uh, is under one max, and the container is also under one megabytes. 
So yeah, as I, as I told, it consider writing the, the operator in the same language as you write the operands. Yesterday there was talk about Python SDK for operators from Subin, which is another approach. And something that allows all this interoperation is a tool called OLM, Operator Lifecycle Management, where you can uh, mani put metadata or write, describe metadata about your operators by something called Cluster Service Version Manifests, where you can describe like what op your operator requires when it comes to writes, like what uh, reads and what, what, what the resources it should, it should be able to read and write, but also what custom resources it should be created for it. So it's, it's kind of workaround in OpenShift to overcome this need for cluster admin, right? So we can you can create this uh, CSV manifest and the OpenShift itself. There is an operator that watches for these CSV files and it will create these custom resources for you. Uh, there is an operator marketplace these days and you can, and also app registry when you can store these YAMLs and you can push uh, those YAMLs using uh, something called operator courier. So you can have your operator uh, deploy it or uh, release it as a Docker image and then provide this manifest in a quai.io from which people can, can use it. This is the example of the operator hub.io and there is Spark operator right here. So this is the Java operator. The other famous operator written in Java is Streamzy for Apache Kafka. But mostly all of them, the others are, are written in Go. So how to start a new operator? Like first, understand what you want to do, understand your domain. We have examples for the Java operators. And yeah, copy-pasting is always a good source of information when, it, when it's, we are in the open source world. So here is the point I would like to, I wanted to like to make, that if you have your existing framework, be it database, distributed system, whatever, written in Java, consider using the same language because you can maintain the expertise or people don't have to use another language just for writing an operator. It can be useful for when it comes to money. Thank you, that was, that was, that was it. Questions. Yeah, are there any questions? Zach, all the way in the back. Thank you, great presentation. Uh, just had a, I just saw that you mentioned uh, Corcus. If you can tell us a little bit more about what Corcus is for those who don't know. Can you talk up, speak up a little bit? You, you mentioned something about the Java footprint and using Corcus, how that might may help. Maybe if you can explain explain that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Sure. So Corcus.io is a framework uh, developed in Red Hat internally, and it uses Graal VM, which is a compiler uh, started in Oracle, and it provides a way to uh, take your jar file and create like one binary from it. It's like one one of the functions of Graal VM that, that contains more features, and they call it native image. So it takes this jar file and transforms it to statically uh, just one binary that has statically linked everything together, which is self-contained binary that can be run. And how it, does it work? It, in Java, or like the code is interpreted. You have the bytecode, right? And JVM tries to interpret the bytecode. And after some certain period of time, it identifies the hotspots, like which lines of this bytecode were run frequently. And it, the just-in-time compiler kicks in and tries to compile the like, hotspots for the bytecode. But in GraalVM, they basically compile everything in advance. So it, they sacrifice the interoperability between different platforms. It's not right once run anywhere anymore, but you get the fast bootstrap because they also have some smart features that it will actually try to evaluate all those static initializers, create a, a heap snapshot, and the heap snapshot is part of the image itself. So once it's starting, it just loads this uh, snapshot of this heap and it's able to start faster. Sparkles in nutshell. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, thank you.
thanks for the talk. I'm glad to see things happening in other languages. Uh, I was wondering, though, um, after you've made your operator or while you're making it, how difficult are these things to debug um, when you're when you're building it? I imagine, like in the reconciliation loop or something like this, you might have bugs. Uh, how hard is that uh, typically in your experience? I mean, I, I think it's pretty easy. Um, one of the things you didn't see here, like what, what you saw uh, Yurka doing with the example was he started the pod that has the operator in it, and the operator is just an application, and we could tail the logs from that, so you could see we could see the logs coming out. But there's actually another way we could run it. We could run it locally on the laptop, and you could have it connected remotely to the cluster doing the same thing. So you could actually run, um, you know, like your IDE, like Eclipse or something like that. You could run the operator in Eclipse, and so if you wanted to, you could actually go to the level of using a step debugger on the actual operator code. And that, and that isn't just JVM. You can do that in a lot of different languages. So you know, there's a, an Ansible operator, right, that comes out of the operator SDK framework. You can actually run that locally as well and just tail the logs right there and see what's going on. So I think, I don't know, I think like, maybe I'm speaking for Yurka a little bit much here, but I think we both found it pretty easy to debug these things by running it locally or running it, you know, in whatever tooling you wanted to use, basically. And that's actually the feature that comes for free uh, by using that fabricated client because it can realize in which environment is running. If it is in Docker environment in Kubernetes or on the local host, it can take the uh, Kubernetes config file from whatever it. It has some like rules uh, that it, uh, that takes precedence, like precedency rules, like from which it takes the config file. But if, if it succeeds, it just takes it and, and runs. Yeah. Can the uh, OLM be leveraged to make it easier for um, less privileged users to install these objects, or do you still need admin to use that? So I, I'm having a little trouble hearing you say, well, using the OLM, is it easier for less privileged users to install an operator? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you talked about how you know basically you have need to have admin privs to actually do the install. I was wondering if the OLM can be a way to get around that problem. I think I think you still need a I think you still need a cluster admin to install the custom resource definitions for you, but can that be done through the OLM? Yeah, I think with OLM the CSV custom resource definitions is already there, so you need a right to to be able to create the new CSV, and then the OLM um, manager or OLM operator will create those CRDs for you. So it like kind of shifts the, the program right. somewhere else. So you need a different set of privileges to yeah. do that, basically. So you know, but presumably it's less than cluster admin still. Yeah. yeah. You know, like this is when you're getting into Kubernetes, and we talked about role-based access for all the different objects. It's like this is just one more object you can put a role on, and so it's like, all right, well, is someone privileged enough to install an operator in your cluster? You know, yes or no. So, but I, like we're saying, the, the custom resource definition will have to be there yeah. in order for the OLM to be able to deploy your operator so someone would have had to install it presumably a cluster administrator and actually there are like se seven or even more other custom resources just for the OLM to work well there's like subscription and something like that so you can subscribe to some to a channel of where the, your operator is, sub is published and you can cr create new versions so it can provide auto updates and such such things and it's it's like uh, Ideally, people don't have to care about the CRDs at all. It should be exposed by the console in OpenShift. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, we're pretty well. That's also awesome. again too quick. Can I turn it off? Oh, I just leave it on. How'd we do on time? What time?